So welcome to our second lecture, dealing with intermolecular forces in condensing gases out of the gas phase. And so we are talking about our intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are the forces of attraction that condense gases out of the gas phase. If it wasn't for the intermolecular forces, everything in the universe would be in the gas phase. The first of our intermolecular forces are London's forces. London forces come about because as the electrons move around the atoms and in the molecules, they try and avoid the electrons of other atoms and molecules. And this produces an asymmetric distribution of electrons in the atoms and molecules, which create small dipoles, and these dipoles attract. But the London forces are relatively weak. They only work when their atoms are close together. They are aided by big heavy molecules. Heavy molecules move slowly. Large molecules, that is ones that have lots of atoms, give the electrons more room to play around with. So large heavy molecules are easy to get out of the gas phase. Small light molecules are going to be very hard to get out of the gas phase. Second, we have dipole-dipole. Dipole is a much more stronger force than London forces, but you do in fact have to have dipoles to have a dipole-dipole attraction. And that's why we went through all the stuff on Vesper, so that you could tell whether molecules were polar or not polar. The polar molecules are going to have dipole-dipole attraction and be much easier to condense out of the gas phase. And finally, our special case, hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding requires hydrogen to be bonded to oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen in somewhere in your molecule. If hydrogen is bonded to anything else, it's not going to be able to hydrogen bond. And if you don't have oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen in your molecule, there will be nothing for the hydrogens to bond to. So to get hydrogen bonding, we need nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine somewhere in our molecule. So let's look at a number of compounds. These five molecules would all be in the gas phase at 100 degrees Celsius in the one atmosphere of pressure. If we start cooling them off, eventually they will start to condense out of the gas phase. And so the question becomes, who's going to condense first? Who's going to condense last? That is, who's going to be the easiest to get out of the gas phase? Who's going to be the hardest? Well, that'll depend on their intermolecular forces. The stronger the attractive forces, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the easier the gas will be to condense. The weaker the intermolecular forces, the harder it will be to condense the gas. So compound number one is acetone. And what intermolecular forces does acetone have? Well, it's got London forces. Everything has London forces. And it weighs 58 grams per mole. It also has dipole-dipole. The oxygen is way more electronegative than the carbon. That's going to be a polar bond. There's nothing to cancel it. So that's going to be a very polar molecule. Number two is 2-propanol often called rubbing alcohol. And what does it have? Well, again, it's got London forces. Everything has London forces, and it weighs 60 grams per mole. It also has dipole-dipole. The oxygen is more electronegative than either the hydrogen or the carbon, and so those bonds will be polar. The shape around the oxygen, of course, is bent. You remember that from Vesper, and therefore, those two dipoles aren't going to cancel. It's going to have dipole, dipole. But yes, something special. That hydrogen is bonded to the oxygen. And therefore, we are going to be able to have hydrogen bonding in this case. Number three is butane, often called lighter fluid. And what does it have? Well, it has London forces, because everything has London forces, and it weighs 58. Which brings us to number four, methyl ethyl ether. What does it have? Well, it has London forces. Everything has London forces, and it weighs 60 grams per mole. It also has dipole-dipole. 
the oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon. And again, the shape around that oxygen is going to be bent, so those dipoles aren't going to cancel. We do have oxygens and hydrogens, but again, the hydrogens aren't bonded to the oxygen, and therefore it's not possible to have hydrogen bonding. And that finally brings us to chlorine. And of course, the chlorine has London forces, because everything has London forces, and it weighs 71. So which of these molecules has the strongest intermolecular forces that is going to be the easiest to condense out of the gas phase, which has the weakest? Clearly, number two has the strongest set of forces. It's got about the same amount of London forces as everything else. It's also got dipole, dipole, but in addition, it's hydrogen bonding. And so, yes, number two would be the first to start to condense, and it would start condensing at about 82 degrees Celsius. Who's going to be next? Well, we have two which have London forces and dipole, dipole, number one and number four. And it turns out number one is a much more polar molecule, since there isn't anything canceling the carbon-oxygen dipole, whereas the other one, the two carbon-oxygen bonds, are somewhat bent and therefore somewhat canceling. So the acetone would be next. It would start condensing at 56 degrees Celsius. The methyl ethyl ether wouldn't start condensing until 11 degrees Celsius. That brings us down to 3 and 5, both of which are relying only on the London forces. The chlorine is heavier, which means its particles would be moving somewhat slower than the butane. But the butane is much larger. It includes 14 atoms, whereas the chlorine only has two atoms in its molecule. And so the butane would be next. It would start condensing at about minus 5 degrees Celsius, whereas the chlorine wouldn't start condensing out of the gas phase until it was minus 35 degrees Celsius. And so you can use the amount of intermolecular forces a gas or molecule has as an estimate and allow you to estimate more or less how easy it is going to be to condense out of the gas phase. The ones with the strongest forces condense easily. The one with the weakest forces are going to have to be cooled down the most. So far, we've been looking at things from the direction of the gas, what's going on in the gas. Now we're going to change direction. We're going to start looking at it from the other point of view. That is, from the stuff that has already been condensed. So we have a liquid sitting in a beaker. And the question is, why? And the answer, of course, is the intermolecular forces have won. That's what we said. If it weren't for the intermolecular forces, everything in the universe would be in the gas phase. The intermolecular forces have won. The gas has condensed, and so we have a liquid sitting in our beaker. So what's going on? Well, we just said the whole reason the liquid is in the beaker is because the particles are attracted to each other. They're being held together in the form of liquid. And each of the particles, of course, is surrounded by the other molecules and attracted to all of them. Well, not quite. Yes, most of the particles down in the bulk of the liquid are, in fact, surrounded by other molecules and attracted to them, but not the ones at the surface. The ones at the surface are only being pulled in one direction. The air isn't producing any attraction for them, so they're only getting pulled toward the liquid. And more specifically, the ones on the corners are not surrounded by water molecules. They only have molecules on one side in one direction, and they're feeling an attraction in that direction. And what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is there's one direction they're feeling attracted. They're going to move in that direction. And so we see the molecules in the corners of our liquid pull in toward the liquid itself. And we end up with a curved surface with the particles on the side being more pulled in. If you ever have seen pictures from Skylab, they showed you a number of liquids out in space where they didn't have any containers. And what those did, of course, was is they all pulled in. And you end up with a sphere. 
as they all the corners disappear. This happens, of course, because we said the particles are attracted to the other particles in the liquid. And if they have no attraction for the walls of the container, they have no reason to try and stick to it. But what if they do, in fact, have some attraction for the side walls? If we pour water into a glass container, glass is basically silicon oxide, an ionic type of compound. And water is a good environment for ions. It's attractive to ions. So if you put water into a glass container, the water actually climbs up the sides of the container because it is attracted to the glass. And in this case, you get a meniscus that curves down. And so water gives you a curved down meniscus. If you remember the barometer when we were talking about gases in lab, we said the mercury had no attraction for the glass. And so the mercury had a curved up meniscus. But water is attracted to glass. And so you get a curved down meniscus for water. So let's go back to our liquid sitting in our beaker. What else is going on? Like we said, the particles are all attracting to each other, which is why it's a liquid. But what else is going on? Well, what else is going on is the particles are, in fact, moving. And they're close together, which means they are banging into each other constantly. There are just something like 10 to the 30th collisions inside a beaker of water at room temperature. So the particles are constantly bumping into each other. Which brings us to the interesting thing about the surface. Like we said, the particles on the surface are not surrounded by the other particles. They only have particles on one side, which means the ones at the surface are constantly getting bumped and jostled by the particles below them. And what is this going to do? Well, what's going to happen is from time to time, those particles on the surface are going to get hit or bumped from below hard enough that they're going to get kicked off the surface. It's only the intermolecular horse forces holding them in place. And if they get hard enough, they will, in fact, get kicked back into the gas phase. And so we lose particles off the surface. And so we talk about evaporation, the loss of higher energy particles off the surface. And the point is, this goes on constantly. The liquid is constantly losing particles, getting kicked off into the gas phase. And of course, what do gases do? They spread out. In other words, they go away. So given that this is going on constantly, and that the particles that are actually kicked into the gas phase just wander away, what's going to happen? What, of course, is going to happen is eventually the liquid will, in fact, be gone. It will all evaporate. It will all eventually get kicked off into the gas phase. So in fact, if we want the liquid to stay in the beaker, we in fact are going to have to close the container. And now the particles that get kicked off into the vapor phase, in fact, have nowhere to go. And eventually what is going to happen, of course, is after bouncing around in the gas phase from, for a while, they're going to come back and hit the surface of the liquid, and some of them are going to get recaptured. And so we're going to have two competing effects. Particles are going to constantly be getting kicked off the surface, but eventually we're going to start recapturing them at the same rate, and we'll end up with what is known as a vapor pressure. There'll be some amount of gas liquid in the gas phase above the liquid, and that's what people are talking about when they talk about the vapor pressure. The vapor is the gas phase above the liquid resulting from evaporation. And that brings us to the end of today's lecture on intermolecular forces and liquids. Have a nice day.